want to begin. I want to begin with some quick housekeeping. You might have just heard that there's recording in progress, and that would, uh, was going to be my first point. So we are recording this webinar um, just so that we can share it afterwards on our website. Um, we have something called the Learning Corner where you will be able to go back to this webinar or share it with colleagues or anyone who, think, who you think might be interested in it. Um, yeah, just so that we preserve it for learning purposes. Um, if you haven't done so yet, it would be great if you went in your Zoom window um, on the field that is renaming yourself um, and to name yourself first name, last name, and then your organization. So. For the Q&A portion, we will actually know who we will be talking to. Um, to make this a nice viewing experience for you, I'm aware that probably most of you are very aware of how Zoom works, but um, maybe for the one or two who are not that familiar with it, um, you can actually decide by yourself how you want to view this webinar, if you want to have a speaker view or a gallery view. Um, for the part where we have a presentation, I would recommend the speaker view um, for the discussion part later on, the Q&A portion of this webinar, the gallery view might actually be nicer if a lot of people have their camera on so you can see who else is in the room with you. Um, if you have questions during this webinar, which we highly encourage, um, please use the little um, in the reactions um, field on your Zoom window. Um, there is a little icon that allows you to raise your hand please do that or simply write your question in your chat, whichever way you choose, I'll probably call on you to ask your question directly um, because we wanna encourage to have a, a proper conversation instead of me just re uh, reading things from the chat. Um, and when you're not speaking, please mute yourself. Um, what do we wanna to do today? So as I said, we wanna speak about the side wind right tool that has been developed by the Nature Conservancy. Um, and there's quite a few parts to this. So we're first going to hear from Nathan Cummins, who is uh, the Great Plains Renewable Energy Strategy Director of TNC. And he's going to talk about the background um, of TNC's clean and green, clean and green renewable energy strategy. Um, we're also going to hear from Michael Furr, um, who's the Oklahoma State Director of TNC, and is talking about why TNC cares about wind siting in the central US. Um, we are also going to hear from uh, Chris Heiss, who is talking about the technical details and is actually going to show us the tool. Um, and we have Nelson, uh, Nelson Johnson with us today as well, who is going to talk about the power of place project that is connected to this tool as well. Um, and we're going to hear a bit about outreach and education from Nathan again in the end. Um, before I hand over to the colleagues from TNC, um, for all of those in the webinar today who might not know who these people are who are hosting this webinar. Um, so we are RGI, um, a unique cooperation between industry and civil society is uh, what we usually say we are. Um, we're an association based in Berlin. Um, yeah, as I said, with a considerably unique membership structure, meaning um, an unlikely combination of transmission system operators and climate and uh, nature NGOs who have quite a while ago now decided to work together under the roof of RGI um, to work on the energy system of the future. And um, what, oh, no, actually I have a different slide here. So as you can see here, we really come from all across Europe. Um, so represent a good portion um, of the European energy system within our membership. And what is actually a big pillar of our work is that we share best practices, um, mostly via our Good Practice of the Year Award, but we always try to share them via many different channels to reach as many members of our potential audience as possible. This includes reports, showcasing them in our database, showing them as best practice fairs, um, talking about them during webinars, such as we do today. Um, yeah, and it's meant to be a learning experience for everyone involved. Um, and yeah, with that, I think I can hand over to Nathan from uh, TNC 
And uh, all of you, I just want to encourage you one more time to carefully listen um, and think about the questions that you want to ask to get the most of this learning experience today as possible. Um, Nathan. Great. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah th thanks so much, Stephanie. We're, we're, we're quite excited for this webinar. Um, what we're going to do here, as Stephanie said, is do sort of a showcase of a few different renewable energy projects that the Nature Conservancy is working on. And also just talk more generally, you know, why, why is TNC coming to this space and what are we, what are we trying to do with this work? Um, we'll have a couple opportunities within our presentation that will stop for questions. But as Stephanie said, please put um, any questions you have in the chat um, and we will get a chance to answer them. And any we don't, we will be certain to follow up on. Um, and so with that, you know, I'm going to start us off to provide just an overview, and then I'll, I'll turn to some of my colleagues to provide more of the technical details. Um, so the first thing I wanted to, you know, talk about for folks that might not be aware of just a little bit about the Nature Conservancy, you know, so our mission here is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. Uh, we work across the across the globe, um, that I'll show you here in a second. And our, our mission is is full encompassing. So it's, we're thinking about climate, we're thinking about biodiversity, we're thinking about food and agriculture, we're thinking about healthy oceans. Um, and you know how how do we how do we make a world where where we all can thrive? And this little uh, uh, baby bison here, uh, or as some folks call them, a cinnamon bun. Uh, this is one of the first baby bison that was born at the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve in Oklahoma, which which Mike and Chris will talk about in a second. So just you know, we 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 manage on the ground, and we also and we also think about things from more of a of a stakeholder perspective, policy and practices as well. So as I said, we have a large reaching uh, network. We operate in 72, 72 countries, all fifty states in the U.S. Over a million members. We're very much a science based organization, and I think that'll come out in the strategy we talk about here today in terms of our renewable energy. So first, you know, what are we trying to do? Well, we're, we're trying to see an, uh, a renewable energy transition that we're calling clean and green. So, so what do we mean by that? Well, obviously renewable energy is inherently clean energy and there's, there's a lot of co-benefits associated with that. And the Nature Conservancy positively supports that. And we wanna see the world transition to renewable energy as quickly as possible to meet our climate goals. That being said, we also recognize that there are biodiversity goals and there are there are places that we've been working really hard to conserve. And with this transition, unlike other energy um, energy systems transition, it's not that it's just going to go in one place. It's going to be it's going to be everywhere. And we need to be really thoughtful about what that planning means and how do we achieve our renewable energy goals without setting back conservation goals. So when we talk about green renewable energy, we're talking about renewable energy that has been cited responsibly, that has, you know, community input that, that minimizes in both direct and impacts, direct and indirect impacts to habitat and wildlife. And that's what we're really going to be spending a lot of this presentation on. But just at a high level, you know, it's also raising that awareness to make sure folks know, you know, there's like any developments, we need to think about how we do this responsibly and how we bring the right stakeholders into, in, into account. So one of the things that made us start thinking about this is we recognize that there's there's a really large build out challenge coming. And this is not just coming in the US, it's coming globally as well, where we're gonna need to rapidly expand the amount of renewable energy capacity to meet Paris goals and even potentially exceed those goals to get to net zero by 2050. And uh, we recognize that wind and solar energy uh, do require a lot of land, like, like many energy systems, you know, you can't just Put them in one area and that that's 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 all that counts the, the wind turbines need to be spread across the landscape as chris will talk about and solar does take up a lot of land within the actual um facility and so recognizing that we realize that there 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 needs to be thoughtful planning on this for example princeton university just came out with a study that uh modeled what a net zero uh future in 2050 could look like for the united states and they predicted uh, the renewable energy alone would take up a combined land area of the of our states of Colorado and Wyoming, which are two large Western states in the United States. So that really is opening a lot of eyes out here of how do we do this in a manner that that drives towards low impact? Because if we don't, there's a large potential for build out conflicts. And I'm, I know this is part of what what uh, talked about with this webinar, which we talked about the folks at RGI is these these conflicts can happen from an environmental perspective, which can slow down projects, 
from a social and community perspective and just from a more general land use perspective is what's the best use of the land in these communities. So we want to make sure that uh, we're thoughtful on this because these conflicts really can slow down our progress towards a low carbon future, both in just uh, delaying the deployment of these of these projects. We've done some studies in the central United States we can talk about later on that, but then also uh, we don't want to see sort of a two steps forward two steps back approach to how we think about carbon broadly. So if we're building renewable energy, but but building it in landscapes that are naturally storing carbon, well, that might not be the best approach. Luckily, though, uh, we've done research and we've we've looked at this problem and we've we found that we can we can meet Paris Agreement goals 17 times over without disrupting natural lands, just building on low impact lands. So these are lands that have already been developed. These are lands that are previously developed. These are lands that have low biodiversity and conservation values. And we've mapped this across the world in one of our science papers, Paris to Practice. And that's a very high level look. But then when we when we zoom down into, into separate geographies, we find very similar results. So Chris will talk about this in a bit, but we found really positive results in the central United States as well. And that's really understanding the fact that we we don't have as we 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 have a lot of these low impact lands. So it's really how can we incentivize deployment in those low impact lands rather than rather than um, just building it where the wind and the sun blow where the wind blows the most and the sun shines the most uh, because that's one of the advantages we have with renewable energy is the resources really everywhere and so we can take advantage of that in a way that traditional energy systems uh, potentially can't and so if we do if we do that and we build onto these lower impact lands you know we, we see a really an opportunity for a better build out so one where in our part of the country we don't have to we don't have to ask the question do we need our power or do we get our prairies because we can have both we can have a transition that accelerates the deployment of renewable energy by avoiding those conflicts that can come from building in these high these key wildlife areas and then we can also avoid the loss of carbon storage um, protect wildlife and hab habitats and by doing so amplify the communal co-benefits associated with this and we think by doing this, you know, we can really meet climate and nature goals in our in this build out. So how do we do that? Well, at a high level, we it's sort of a, a go smart to go fast approach. So this is a look at our clean and green pathways report that we released last year around this time that look globally, how you know, what are different ways that the world can meet a, a clean and green energy transition. So thought about policy pathways, market pathways, planning pathways, um financing pathways etc for 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 doing this build down it's really been the basis of our work and uh our my colleagues bruce mckinney and jessica wilkinson were key on building this report out and building this framework that we've been working from and at a very high level you know i think you can just call it kind of plan site buy so so we think about are there ways that you can you can plan renewables um, that that take nature into account when we're thinking about these large scale decarbonization scenarios. So that's something that Nels is going to talk to you all about here in a little bit that we've done in the US um, and in California and also um, model the, the needed renewable energy build out. So we know what we need to do and how we can get there in the lowest impact manner possible. While that's happening, we recognize that renewable energy is being cited today. So can you develop the policies and incentives guidelines and the tools to allow for decision makers to, to, to make the best decisions about where these renewable energy systems are going using the best available science. And that's what we've really done with our site wind right uh, map that <clears throat> Chris and Mike are gonna spend more details on. And lastly, we, we reckon the United States, um, especially the corporate power market is, is a large driver of the large scale renewable energy build out in a way that, um, Given the cost competitive cost competitiveness of the industry, you would we would not have expected even five, 10 years years ago. So can we work with the industry, both the developers and the buyers, to set some standards to allow um, the the folks utilizing best practices to really float to the top and make sure that companies, when they're achieving their climate goals, can also achieve biodiversity goals that we are all um, working for as well. So with that, that's just a very high level framing. Now I'm going to turn it to my um, colleague, Chris and Mike, who are going to talk a little bit more about how we're implementing that framing in the central US, then we'll have a time for, for questions. So Chris, you want to go? Sure. 
Um, yeah, thanks, Chris Nathan. Uh, again, I'm Chris Heiss. I'm, I'm with the Oklahoma chapter, and I've been working with Mike, Nathan, and Nels to support uh, the Nature Conservancy's uh, work in this space, particularly in the central US. Uh, next slide. <laughs> can you hear me, Nathan? Yeah, I, I can hear you. Did the slide not? Oh, there he goes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we got advanced. it now. It's advanced on my screen. Sorry. Yeah, we, we've got it. No problem. So, um, yeah, uh, the you know the Great Plains Step is is an iconic North American landscape with wide open spaces that seem to go on forever. You know, and at first blush, it may seem like it's a great place for wind, and that conservation concerns are few and far between. But in reality, uh, the Great Plains is really a very much a threatened ecosystem. Uh, in the tall grass prairie region of the Eastern Great Plains, something like 95% of the natural land cover has been lost to agricultural development. Uh, temperate grasslands are the least protected and the most converted biome type on the planet. These grasslands are now providing you know, food to a lot of the people that live on earth. And that, that makes you know, it's no different in the, the central United States. So you know, that makes the protection of these few remaining areas of intact natural grasslands a high priority for the Nature Conservancy. Next slide. <laughs> All right, great. So, uh, you know, as Nathan mentioned, uh, the Conservancy recognizes that climate change is a significant uh, threat to our conservation work around the world. And as such, we, we strongly support and encourage the development of renewable energy as a way to reduce our carbon emissions. Um, you know, that said, improperly sited wind energy facilities do pose known threats to certain wildlife populations um, and can otherwise seriously de degrade these you know, few remaining natural habitats that we have. So we wanna ensure that as the industry continues to grow and expand, that the, the ecological cost of that development do not outweigh uh, the potential environmental benefits. Next slide. <clears throat> Zoom is always interesting. <laughs> there we go. Uh, the Conservancy also recognizes that renewable energy development can provide really valuable economic development opportunities for landowners and local communities in the central U.S. in places where those opportunities are relatively scarce. Um, and so if we can ensure that these facilities are sited in agricultural lands or previously disturbed areas that have limited conservation value, um, it can be a real positive for both nature and people. Next slide. So um, the Nature Conservancy has a long history of conservation and land use planning in North America. Um, our scientists you know, recognize the potential challenges and opportunities with renewable build out in the central US some time ago. Um, since the year 2010, we have published a number of assessments on wind and wildlife interactions, uh, both on our own and in cooperation with partner organizations. So um, these studies, which were written by people that are a lot smarter than yours truly, uh, really informed the site wind right work that you will see presented today. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike Fuhrer and he'll tell you a little bit about the history of our site wind right project. And then I will rejoin you in a few minutes for some details. Thanks, Chris. Um, like any project of this scale, it has evolved over time. And that evolution uh, was really important because it, it brought us to the point where we are today. And, and I think um, uh, the, the other part of the context that I do want to share that uh, influenced that evolution is the fact that much of the Great Plains, including Oklahoma, where Chris and I work, but uh, all the states around us in the Great Plains, it's a privately owned landscape, which is, I think, um, uh, the approach to conservation uh, makes it uniquely uh, United States from the perspective of it's very pro landowner rights and it's very anti uh, regulatory approach to things like conservation. So even in this renewable energy space, there's been a lot of pushback against, uh, and this is from the onset of development in the Great Plains, there's been a lot of pushback against uh, 
uh, regulatory approach uh, for siting of renewable energy. And as a result, uh, our approach has had to thread the needle on how we try and influence where renewable energy is siting, keep it on those already disturbed areas and away from those uh, pristine or high quality uh, habitats that uh, uh, we want to conserve. So very early on, uh, our map was simply a map that included uh, identification of sensitive habitats and those places where uh, those sensitive habitats still remain uh, in Oklahoma. Um, and that was regardless of whether or not uh, there was any science suggesting that there are negative impacts to the species and habitats found there. Uh, of course, uh, we had to move beyond that and uh, we did so uh, after further consultation with uh, wind developers, uh, university professors, etc. cetera. Uh, we also attempted uh, a, an approach that was uh, specific to one species. Uh, that's what you see under uh, 2010. Uh, there's uh, an iconic species uh, found here in the Great Plains called the lesser prairie chicken. It is a prairie grouse species that's been on the decline for decades. Uh, there was talk at the time about um, enacting um, some regulatory approaches to uh, conserving the habitat and the species itself under the federal government's Endangered Species Act. There was a tremendous amount of pushback. So we, uh, along with uh, our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, several state agencies, uh, other NGOs, universities, developed uh, a voluntary mitigation approach. That's what you see here in this map. The, the idea was to uh, put a higher voluntary price tag on development in those areas that are primary, uh, most important for lesser prairie chicken and, and uh, less expensive or not at all in those areas that were already disturbed. Um, it was a really a fantastic effort. Um, however, um, there was not a lot of participation. In fact, uh, since 2010, I think we've had a total of zero developers uh, uh, contribute any voluntary mitigation dollars towards uh, this effort. Those mitigation dollars, by the way, would have been utilized to protect additional lesser prairie chicken habitat. Uh, so we learned a lot from that and uh, learned that uh, we had to take a somewhat different approach. At the same time, other states, uh, uh, state agencies, as well as the Nature Conservancy, other uh, business units in the United States and the Great Plains were thinking about the same thing. Um, you see an example uh, from Nebraska, a state uh, north of Oklahoma that uh, was also thinking about this in the same way that we were. They incorporated some of the same data, some of the same approaches, but incorporated some things that were a little different uh, that also informed uh, where we ultimately landed uh, on the right, which was the very first version of Site One to Right. And that covered uh, Oklahoma on the bottom, Kansas, and, and a portion of the Texas Panhandle, uh, where we were seeing a lot of uh, initial development. And uh, therefore, we wanted to respond and provide a tool uh, to developers that would help ultimately uh, steer that development to those places that would have the least amount or no impact to those important habitats that Chris mentioned. Next slide. The other part of the evolution uh, was outside of the map. The map is a foundational component of Site Wind Right. However, we've recognized that we need to do more than just provide a map. And so uh, these are the other parts of uh, our approach to uh, wind siting in the Great Plains. There has to be some policies and incentives to accelerate this low impact renewable energy deployment to those places where we want to see it versus those sensitive habitats. We also recognize that, uh, especially early on, there's a dearth of uh, science on the impacts. And, and um, although that's improved, uh, there are still some gaps and, and we want to participate in uh, developing additional science through partnerships, work with universities, even work with uh, the private sector. Um, the map, uh, the third bullet is still a really important uh, uh, component of this. Um, and that has continued to evolve um, uh, from the map that you just saw on the previous slide. Uh, but that is a foundational component of our approach to inciting. And then lastly, we do want to collaborate with the renewable energy sector to advance good siting practices. Um, and this is an ongoing effort, and we have a lot of corporate engagement work that's focused on uh, collaborating and trying to generate momentum to push development uh, in the right direction. So, again, this has evolved, and what you're going to see a little bit more about here in a second uh, is the result of, you know, between 10 and 15 years of work 
lessons learned, um, some uh, situations where uh, we were surprised, situations where we weren't so surprised, all that is rolled into uh, the current version of Site Wonder Ride. And I would guess that it will continue to evolve, especially when we uh, think about incorporating solar, uh, which is really also starting to come to the Great Plains. Chris, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thanks, Mike. So Nathan, are we gonna try the screen control trick? Yeah, we'll see how this works. <laughs> so um, the area that we chose for the site wind right assessment that we're talking about today includes 17 states in the central part of the US, a region that's informally known as the wind belt. It has by far the highest and best uh, raw wind resource potential uh, on the continent. And if we look at, um, Plan developments and encompasses about 80% of the existing and installed wind capacity in the United States. So I'm going to attempt to advance the slides and seem to be having a few challenges with that today. Apologize for that. Oh, yep. Sorry. <laughs> this is going to be fun. All right. So, um, our site wind right project really, you know, it encompasses a series of maps. The first is really our primary product and what we are now calling the site wind right map. It represents rare species distributions, sensitive, sensitive natural habitats where wind development in particular may pose known threats to wildlife. So our key wildlife areas map includes things like Migratory stopover site for the migratory stopover sites for the uh, whooping crane. This is a highly endangered bird that migrates uh, twice each year between the Texas Gulf Coast and wetlands in central Canada. Um, at present, uh, collision mortality represents the greatest single threat, uh, the highest, yeah, the, the greatest single cause of mortality for whooping cranes during migration. And there is a great deal of concern that as wind energy continues to expand within this migratory corridor that that could negatively impact whooping cranes. So we, um, we did some modeling and used some telemetry studies to determine where those important stopover sites are located so that they can be avoided. We also mapped areas that are important uh, nesting habitats for eagles and other raptors. We identified priority habitats for the seven species of prairie grouse that occur within this region, including the lesser prairie chicken, as Mike mentioned earlier. We also mapped areas of high waterfowl breeding density up in the northern Great Plains, a region known as the prairie pothole landscape. We also mapped uh, important bird areas designated by the National Audubon Society and other organizations. And we did this specifically for five states in the upper Midwest where those areas were not adequately captured by the other conservation layers in this assessment. Bat mortality uh, likely represents the greatest single wildlife risk to wind development in the central US. And unfortunately, there's still a great deal that we don't understand about this phenomena. But where available, we did map the locations of known important bat hibernacula and buffered those based on foraging distance and other aspects of species biology in an attempt to uh, reduce the mortality, uh, collision mortality as much as we possibly could. We also mapped uh, federally, uh, federally listed threatened and endangered species habitats, uh, places where wind development is subject to regulatory controls and generally a bad idea. Uh, we also mapped crucial wintering range and migration corridors for big game animals in the Rocky Mountain states. Uh, open water and wetland features, as well as important riparian corridors and buffers around really important wetland complexes that have um, a lot of use by uh, migrating and wintering water birds. Protected and managed lands in this landscape include things like national parks, national wildlife refuges, state managed game areas, as well as nature conservancy, uh, conservation easements and privately protected properties. Uh, again, you know, we, the vast majority of the landscape in this region has been altered by development and that makes the protection of the few remaining areas of intact natural habitats, including grasslands, a really high conservation priority for the nature conservancy. We identified other areas of biodiversity significance that have been uh, mapped in previous conservation assessments by the Nature Conservancy and partner organizations. 
And a fairly recent addition to our map is climate resilient lands. These are areas that are thought to be inherently resilient to climate change uh, based on uh, topoedaphic factors and will likely be increasingly important to wildlife conservation in the future. So again, this is our primary map product. Uh, we've elected to make a simplified version of this data set available for download so that interested parties can um, access it, incorporate it into their own GIS and use it for decision making. Uh, we also spun up a very simple little uh, online mapping application that uh, non GIS professionals can use just to kind of explore the map a little bit and Nathan will provide a link to that resource toward the end of our presentation here. A uh, secondary component of our work involved identifying potential restrictions to development. These are places where engineering constraints or land use conflicts likely render wind development impractical. Now, this is not our primary concern. You know, obviously, we're a team of biologists, but um, we do realize this is a very important consideration. Uh, developers and utilities are very quick to point out that they face a lot of challenges to project siting that are separate and independent of wildlife concerns. So again, we felt that it was really important to consider these things, at least in some general way, to ensure that our results were realistic. If we're asking people to plan their developments based solely on wildlife considerations, and that eliminates all the areas that they can possibly work, then we don't really have a viable strategy. So um, we map things like uh, buffers around public use and military airfield runways. Uh, special use airspace areas managed by the Federal Aviation Administration. These are very often located around military bases and other places that have a lot of low altitude aerial activity. Uh, we mapped buffers around weather and aerial navigation radar installations where tall structures like wind turbines can cause significant interference. Uh, we mapped existing wind facilities. Wind energy is now a major land use in many of these states, and you, you can't just build new wind farms right on top of the old ones. So we, uh, we mapped existing turbine points to account for that. Um, we mapped all urban lands and other developed areas, places where wind development could have significant human health and safety concerns due to ice throw and other factors. We mapped areas of slope exceeding 20%, where turbine construction can become quite a bit more costly. Uh, open water and wetland features. Uh, we also mapped areas that had relatively poor wind resource. And for our purposes, these include places that have average annual winds less than six and a half meters per second at 80 meters hub height. Now, this is something that will change in time as technology improves. It already is changing in the United States, but for now, this seems to be a pretty good predictor of where wind development will occur in the central part of the country. We ran a simple terrain model to pull out valleys and other low-lying areas that are less likely to be developed for wind in this relatively flat landscape. Uh, wind turbines are typically sited on ridges and other places that are elevated above the general surroundings. And lastly, we map statutory setbacks, places where wind development is legally or functionally restricted. So uh, once we had assembled these two sets of factors, we did some very basic raster GIS, start with the entire study area, subtract the areas that have engineering constraints, and then subtract the map wildlife habitats. The places that are left over should, in theory, be well suited to wind development. So it's, it's not quite that simple. You know, we did a little bit of spatial tinkering with the results to pull out, you know, small and isolated areas that are less likely to be developed for wind. But that's essentially what it is. It's just straight Boolean algebra, A equals B minus C minus D. So this is a map of our results. Again, the green polygons represent places that have no map engineering constraints and no significant wildlife challenges. So the amount of green that you see on the map may look different depending on your perspective, you know, whether you're a conservationist or a wind developer, uh, you may interpret it differently. But if we do the maths on this, then the numbers are really overwhelmingly positive. Um, at a nameplate capacity density of three megawatts per square kilometer, which is an average for all of the installed wind facilities in the United States today, and likely a pretty conservative number, it looks like we've got the potential to install an additional thousand gigawatts of wind capacity. And that's just uh, in these 17 states and just within these mapped green low impact areas. 
1,000 uh, gigawatts is an awful lot of electricity. That's about 10 times the amount of, of wind that's installed in the US today. Now, this particular map is largely conceptual in nature. Um, you know, it's sort of a proof of concept, if you will. Um, there will be wind developed, there will likely be uh, private landowners within these green polygons. Some of them you know, won't want wind development on their property. Uh, we would have to build an awful lot of new transmission capacity in order to get 1,000 gigawatts of wind energy to market. Uh, but what this suggests is you know, if we think and plan carefully that you know, we can do this, uh, not only can we meet our, all these states' existing you know, ambitious renewable energy goals, um, we think we have room to go well beyond that and, and really start to explore deep decarbonization scenarios that will have you know, meaningful impacts on climate change. And again, if we're careful about where we site the facilities, we think we can do that without having major negative impacts on wildlife. So um, I'll turn it back over to Nathan. Thanks, Chris. So we'll just uh, spend the last couple minutes here um, providing just a, high, a couple high level points before we open it up for questions on, on the mapping exercise. And, you know, I think it's important to know that this is a science based approach. So we utilize the best available information, though some of it is proprietary. So we often get questions of why do you provide just one layer of map rather than each individual data layer? And that's just because we don't have access to all of the data we were able to, or some of it is very sensitive and would not want to be shared on a point location. Um, and regardless of what we know, wildlife still will be harmed in unknown and unpredictable ways. So if you build if you build turbines, there there will be impacts. So we're not saying that this is a a catch all approach. This is just based on the best available science where the where the risk is that we know today. And there's some impacts, especially like bat mortality, are poor, poorly understood. And until we know more. It's, it's really imperative we, we, we take a conservative approach um, to make sure that we're not doing irreparable harm to the species. Um, and because of that, we support more and more research going into wind and wildlife interactions, especially on the siting side, at least in the United States. A, a lot of the science to date is really focused on minimization and deterrent technologies, which are really important. Um, but we think more and more effort needs to be put into understanding the actual siting implications of these turbines so we can be uh, more strategic in terms of where they go in the future. And lastly, uh, there's a lot more to this statement, but just at a high level, we don't think, think of this as a go, no go map. You know, ideally uh, we, would, we would incentivize projects outside of our key wildlife areas and disincentivize projects within our key wildlife areas. But with any desktop assessment, you know, the, we, we, it needs to be zoomed in on and really understand what the landscape looks like. And that's, that's the role of uh, federal and state agencies. That's the role of wind developers. That's the role of TNC at times. And so we, we work on that on a, on a project by project basis. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the internal change management that Chris and Mike and we all worked on to, to get this out there. So, you know, as I said, with the Nature Conservancy, we're, we're in all 50 states, but we each state chapter has its own board of trustees. And while we do work together as an organization, each state chapter has its own priorities too. And so when we were really coming into this, one of the big driving reasons was because we realized we weren't providing a uniform answer um, to developers asking about wind energy concerns. And at the same time, we were getting a sort of shop around effect where if one state chapter said, no, we really don't want you to do this, uh, they, they would go around to other parts of our organization to see if they could get a, a different answer. And we really wanted to avoid that. So. We really looked into how could we do this at a regional scale, like Mike talked about. You know, it took three over three years of development to to get from the three state map to this 17 state map you see today. Over 60 TNC staff uh, volunteered their time to to work on this endeavor. Either that is by gathering data, processing data, helping us with our communications plan, helping us with our engagement with companies, with our engagement with policymakers, and the data set that. Chris shared is, is a combination of over a hundred data sets. So, you know, he has his 10 layers that, that, that look pretty neat, but, it, but in actuality, if you look at our methods paper, it's, it's a large amount of data that Chris has processed in a way that is translatable at a high level. And so it does take a lot of work, but we feel really proud about the work we've put in. And um, from, from here now, you know, as Mike mentioned, we're, we're looking into solar and we hope to have a solar version of our map released later this year. And, and we do want to see the map expanded, but right now we, we focused it on the region of the United States that has the most renewable energy development, just because that's where we have our staff resources um, to date. 
So this is, we, as I mentioned, we have a lot of resources on our website, nature.org slash site when right. We have some frequently asked questions documents, some fact sheets, and our detailed methods paper um, that you can read that, that really provides a high level of what Chris just talked, or detailed level of what Chris just went over in terms of the assumptions we used in our study. And um, with that, I thought this could be a good time to pause and see if anyone has questions just on our site when right work, on our methodologies. We, we know that's a lot before we get into the second part of our presentation, which will really talk about a broader decarbonization study that Nels is leading that really is based on a lot of the science that, that Chris and others have developed in this project. Great. Thanks a lot to, <clears throat> to all three of you. Really, really interesting so far. Um, I'm going to assume that there are a lot of questions. So if you have any, please raise your hand um, or write them in the chat. Um, to give you a little bit more time to do that, I'm going to start with a question. Um, so you talked a lot about um, how much work and um, how much dedication went into actually putting all of this together. Can you talk a little bit more to um, what the dealing and wheeling behind the scenes was like and how difficult or what it actually meant in practice to get all of this data and were there um, some pitfalls to avoid if anyone else attempted something as big as this uh, or some learnings that you can give people um, yeah things to avoid things to actually to to absolutely look out for yeah, that, that's a great question. I'll take a first cut at it, but I know that uh, Chris has some thoughts here too, especially since he was really in charge of, of gathering all of this data. I think at a high level, you know, there's a, there's a couple things to think about. Obviously, when you put out a map, you're, you're setting yourself up for a lot of questions and a lot of feedback, and you, we need to think about the scale. So this is a regional-based map. This is not a map that's going to work at, for a site-specific assessment for each state. That was just mm -hmm. infeasible to be able to gather that much data and put and put that out there. So I think within that you 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 do have some balancing acts. So you know, for example, in our Western United States, luckily there's a lot of pretty conserved, intact natural landscapes, but there's a lot of wind. So so there is going to be wind built in the Western United States, and we do have to think about how that'll happen in a way that might be a little outside the site wind right methodology. And that's why I brought Nels in. He's going to talk a little more about how we're thinking about that. Um, and then it's then it's all about balancing interests and making sure that we at the same time stick to the science. So, so you know, everyone is gonna have a little bit of a different interpretation of what should or should not be on the map. And we really, really had to make sure that we based our, our work in science and on the best available science so we could defend it and we could have it using a, a usable product within the industry. So I think those are two high level things. And obviously, you know, giving yourself more time than you think to actually have those discussions and make sure people understand both internally and externally the goal you're trying to do and how how they can support that goal. Um, Chris or, or Nels, would you have anything you want to add to that? I, I think you you covered that pretty well, Nathan. You know the the data assembly was, I guess, a nice way to say it. It's, it was an iterative process. You know, um, that's one of the reasons that it, the project took so long as it. It comes and fits and starts, and you know you involve a lot of different people, and then you have to wait on them to respond. Um, we were, we're really fortunate in the United States in that the Nature Conservancy has chapters in all 50 states, and so we often have scientists and GIS staff that work in all those states and really know the landscape a lot better than you know one person sitting in Oklahoma can you know know this this huge geography. So um, we really relied on our state program staff, to, you know, to, to help tell us what was important and help us inform the model. And they, they did a lot of the legwork on their own, um, looking for data in their own GIS and then, you know, coordinating with state and federal wildlife agency staff that might have the information they needed. Um, so that was very helpful for us in, in putting things together. Um, you know, I, a lot of people look at this map and think it looks really cool, you know, and, and as a scientist, I, I see, I tend to see all the problems with it. You know, I think uh, scientists are, as a group are, are a fairly conservative lot. They don't like to really stick their neck out and say anything unless they're sure. And I, I would certainly count myself as part of that group. But the realization that I came to a few years ago, particularly with renewable energy development, is that, you know, they are building these things on the landscape right now. And so if we wait until we have perfect information, 
you know, this entire phenomenon is going to have passed us by and we won't really be able to have any meaningful, you know, impact on, on the issue. So um, don't, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, I guess is a, a proverb, you know, um, we, we have, you know, again, people are making these decisions now. And if we can get the, whatever information we have that we're comfortable enough to share, you know, I think can be really helpful in solving some of these potential conflicts. Mm. Were there actually any data sets that you were really keen to have as a, an additional layer that you weren't able to get hold of? Uh, yes, uh, you know, I think Nathan and I have both touched on the bat issue. Um, so we have uh, cave roosting bats in North America, and we have a pretty good idea of where those important cave roosts are. Uh, those data are very hard to get. People tend to, you know, be very secretive about those for good reason. You know, they don't want people, you know, happening onto that information and then, you know, disturbing the bats. But we can get our hands on that. The, the real challenge for us um, is migratory tree roosting bats. These are very small cryptic bats that are difficult to study. There's not a lot in the literature about them. They're very broadly distributed across North America, and they move around the landscape over the course of the year. Um, and a, a lot of these species are so small that you, you can't, we don't even have telemetry technology where you could trap them and, you know, stick trackers on them. Uh, that's starting to change a little bit. Um, you know, we're, we're learning more about them in time. And, and I think that will be, that will continue to be a big focus for, uh, you know, wildlife concerns in the central part of the country, improving those data sets. Great. Thanks a lot for these detailed answers. Um, we have a couple of questions by now. Um, one comes from Ricardo Tomé. Ricardo, are you able to unmute yourself and uh, maybe also start your video and ask the question directly yourself? Yes, I think I am. Hello. Hi, <laughs> welcome. Uh, very nice presentation. Thank you uh, all. Um, I was just wondering if in the models you, you developed, you were also um, uh, taking into, into account the potential fragmentation effects. So between the, well, after construction of, of the wind farms in the suitable areas, uh, potential fragmentation effects between, uh, caused by this, by this construction regarding the, the good habitat patches or populations of uh, mammals and, and birds that would, that would anyway subsist in, in the well-preserved areas. If this was also taken into account in, in the model development. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, you want to take a, that one? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and we did attempt to do so. Um, the, the climate layer that I, I think it was the last one that, I sh that we displayed on the map, um, that accounts for kind of the spatial arrangement of habitat patches on the landscape and it attempts to get at that question. Uh, we also attempted to do that with our intact habitats layer. There's a, a moving window component to that that you know, attempts to incorporate fragmenting influences on the landscape. Um, <clears throat> the reality for a lot of us in the central U.S. is that the landscape is already highly fragmented by development. We have lots of roads and ag fields and, you know, other forms of development. So um, <clears throat> in, in a lot of those more fragmented areas, the species that, you know, are, that persist there um, may be somewhat tolerant to, to lower mid-levels of fragmentation, but that's definitely an area that we need to study more and improve on if we can. Thanks a lot, Thank Chris. Um, we have another question. It comes from my colleague Liam. Liam, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Fabulous. Um, my question is about implementation um, and how this was received by the private sector and industry. Um, I'd be interested to know if it was reluctantly received or actually gladly because you've done a lot of work for them. And then as well, related to that question, how did you sell the benefits of this map to industry? How did you get them on board and show them that it's a, a positive development, not just restrictions? Yeah, that's a that, that's a great question, Liam. And I think it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, with anything, it's, it's an evolution. It's an evolutionary approach. I think at the beginning, um, there was some resistance and hesitation from the industry, worried both about uh, this, you know, coming off as anti-renewable for lack of a better terminology, and then also um, worry that it would be utilized by um, just say anti-wind 
folks that are looking for reasons to oppose uh, projects. And what was happening though, is they were using information anyway, and they weren't using it in any science-based approach. So what we think is a, is a valuable resource here is one, it provides a sort of base level of discussion. Two, for the renewable energy developers that are not, you know, the really large developers, it, as you said, it provides them a lot of resources that they wouldn't have gathered on their own. And a lot of these states, a lot of the data came from state wildlife agencies, which are really important in the United States for um, managing the landscape and renewable energy development. And, but they don't have, a lot of them don't have great communications resources or, or staff, they're, they're very overstaffed. So this provides developers an ability to, to have a high level risk screening that's associated with some of the guidelines the agencies want. So I think the developers also recognize that this really can help their consultation product. But I, I will say, you know, there, we, we went into this thinking wind energy developers were our primary audience. And what we've kind of come out realizing is they are an audience, but power purchasers are also a really important audience for this because a lot of the wind energy companies, especially the, the bigger ones, really understand this, but they don't necessarily um, take everything into account. But the, but the, the purchasers really don't want to be saddled with a project that is doing any biodiversity harm. And and they're they're not as familiar with with a lot of these technical details. So so we've seen a lot of corporate power purchasers, companies like Salesforce, PepsiCo, etc., really use this in their um, in their power procurement process and their due diligence process to be able to have a informed and conversation with the developer about what the potential environmental risks of certain wind projects could be and how those could be mitigated. And so so I think with that, there's been much more of an open embrace of it. And I think with the with that embracement, the industry's really started to understand too. Well, you know, we can we can use this to our benefit as well to be able to drive to those lower impact areas and then also highlight our best practices um, and how we are working with organizations like the Nature Conservancy to avoid these impacts. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll add to that just really quickly. I, I think uh, what's helping us out on the, the power purchaser side is that they have sustainability plans that not only focus on renewable energy procurement, but they also have uh, land conservation or biodiversity goals within their sustainability plan. So what they're seeing is that they don't want to set themselves back on the biodiversity side of things uh, while making advancements uh, on uh, the renewable energy side. So um, like Nathan said, it's it is uh, part education right now because a lot of this stuff, the siting issue uh, hasn't been on a lot of uh, companies or even individuals radar screen. You know, people assume, hey, it's renewable energy, it's green, it's gotta be good. But uh, as we all know, um, uh, the devil's in the details and we have to ensure that we do it correctly. Definitely, um, a very good point that you're making there. Um, are there any more questions with regard to the tool itself, how it works, the implications of the tool? Um, right now, I'm not seeing any more. I don't see any hands. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Um, I'm going to give you a few more seconds. And if nothing's coming in, then I would suggest that we move on to talk about the bigger picture, because we also want to discuss um, what we can take away from this for um, offshore and grid spatial planning. Um, and we're going to have another presenter who's going to start us off by talking a bit about this bigger picture. And then we're going to have ample opportunity for Q&A after that again. Um, one second. I'm not properly prepared and forgot my speaker's name. So Nels, uh, I, can, yeah. I found your name. Do you want to start? Thank you very much, Stephanie. And again, it's great to be here and to join all of you this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project that's kind of at the opposite end of the continuum in terms of the time frame. The work that we've just been talking about, Site Wind Right, is really about how do we influence where projects are going now, um, how investors, how developers, how regulators think about where the best places are for infrastructure in the in the near term to the next few years but we wanted to use similar data basically the same data ask a, the bigger question about can we actually get to that net zero future without major environmental impacts and what are the trade-offs as we pursue 
decarbonization pathways to net zero in terms of impacts to the environment, in terms of cost, in terms of reliability of the energy system. So we started in California several years ago after California became the first state to make a commitment to a net zero goal uh, in 2045. Can you just go back one? And um, that was the start of this work. It's now evolved into a nationwide effort to look at the same question for the entire United States. And there's three levels of this work we've done, California, then the Western US, and then we're expanding to the entire US. In all cases, what we're asking is, can we scale up the clean energy we're gonna to need to get to net zero to meet those climate energy goals? And can we do it in a way that avoids or minimizes impacts to natural and working lands? We're also looking at things like prime agricultural lands as part of that analysis. So what are those factors that are gonna shape that systems build out over the next several decades? And what are the different scenarios for how we get there? And what are the trade-offs between those scenarios for these, these cost, reliability, and impact factors? Next. Um, and one of the reasons we're doing this is that this kind of really long range energy planning is a new thing. Typically in the United States, energy planning has been just for the next few years, maybe five years, uh, we haven't had long range planning until it's become more and more clear that we need to dramatically change the energy system in order to get to net zero, to get to a place where climate change isn't just totally uh, out of control and running way beyond two degrees centigrade by mid-century. Um, but the early stages of that planning that have started over the last five or six or eight years, none of those approaches have looked at these environmental impacts, have looked at nature. And so what we've done is bring that into the picture, bring that into the long-term energy planning process modeling uh, so that we can see what those impacts might look like. Um, so that's really kind of the innovation that we're bringing to a rapidly evolving field of energy planning in the United States. Next. And as I mentioned, we're using some of the same data. In fact, it's almost totally overlapping with the same data that we're using for the site wind right um, and site renewables right work that uh, Nathan and Mike and Chris have just been uh, sharing with you. Uh, but we've taken the information and used it a little bit differently. We've taken that information and we've said, what if it's, what if we increase, what happens when we increasingly get more and more restrictive about where energy might go? And we're talking about wind, we're talking about solar, we're talking about um, other forms of energy, uh, potentially hydrogen, um, potentially natural gas with carbon sequestration and storage, but the bulk of it, especially in terms of land use and in terms of environmental impacts, is going to be uh, wind and solar and possibly biomass, depending on the scenario. So what we do is when we run these energy capacity models that we're using some of the most advanced ones, we, we've worked with a, a firm called Evolved Energy that's doing some of the most advanced nationwide work on energy capacity modeling to figure out um, what are the different technology mixes to get to net zero, given different assumptions about technologies, about costs and other things. And then we integrate this these environmental exclusion categories into that modeling to see how that changes where the model picks different sources of energy. So basically we have three levels that the first level is just the status quo. What areas are protected now? So that's kind of, that's what's going to happen if we don't change the way we do siting and the way we think about environmental impacts. The next thing is what if we just said, well, all the places that have administrative designations that are there for some environmental reason, what if we said, you know, we really shouldn't build in those places either, even though we can, and even though you know there are possibilities of developing it, what if we just said 
let's let's not build there either. What does that do to our options? And then the last one is, well, beyond that, we know there are a lot of lands, waters that are not protected. They're not even administratively designated. No one um, is in any legal sense recognize those as places that are important for conservation. And we and others have mapped lots of these areas. There are things like um, wildlife migration corridors. There are things like uh, there's a concentration of rare species in a given area, something we might call a biodiversity hotspot, for example. So, and then what happens when we add that to those other layers? What does that do in terms of our opportunities for clean energy development? So next. So as I mentioned, we started in California uh, a couple of years ago. I'm gonna share a reference that you can go and find that report if you're interested in how this worked. It was published uh, two years ago now. Um, it gives you a pretty good idea of, of the data and the methods that went into this, the modeling that we used. Um, we're now doing it in the Western United States in much more detail. The reason we expanded next to the Western US is there's, first of all, many of those states now have net zero energy commitments. So they've already made those commitments. They're already trying to figure out how do they find a path forward to to get those commitments implemented. So we thought it was very timely. And then we're expanding it this year in next year into uh, the rest of the United States. So we'll have a complete picture of what decarbonization pathways in the United States look like in terms of trade-offs for environmental cost and reliability issues. Next. So this is the results in California. And we actually use four layers. We decided to simplify it when we expanded the geography. So you don't need to focus too much on the differences between the three and the four. The major point is, is on the left is the status quo. On the top, it's for wind, on the, or I mean, for solar. On the bottom, it's for wind. So the, the redder it is, the better the solar resource is, or the darker blue it is, the better the wind resource is. That's what's available right now, just from a strictly legal point of view um, for wind and solar development, where there's a good resource. If you go to two, that's that place where there are administrative designations of environmental value, but it doesn't strictly prohibit you. And in fact, there's lots of projects going into those places. But when you take those places off and you say, we, we shouldn't put energy there, you can see it reduces the amount of energy for solar and wind in that second. And then when you move over to the right, then we get to the most restrictive categories. And you can see, you see a lot less area available for solar, a lot less area for, for wind. Now that picture on the right looks kind of alarming in the sense that it doesn't look, you know, if we zoomed in more, we'd see more orange and, and red, or we'd see more blue. Um, but when you actually total that area up, it's still more than we need to get to net 50 for California, for net zero by, for California. So now we're trying to understand what does that picture look like for the Western United States and again, for the entire United States. Um, I'm gonna share some results from the Western US that shed some light on what does this all look like um, when we expand that geography and we are including offshore wind. So you'll see a little bit about offshore wind. And we are looking at what does this mean for the whole transmission of the grid system? What, what does this mean for our opportunities to unlock these places? Uh, because these are preliminary results, you know, it's gonna be a little hard to see the, the final version of what this looks like. And it's not terribly polished yet, but I thought it might be worth sharing a little insight into this. I'll also mention that um, two colleagues are on the on the line today. John Torgan, who's our Rhode Island director, who has a lot of experience with offshore wind development, our first offshore project, much less than you guys, but uh, our our experience is is right now is mostly in, in New England and in Rhode Island in particular. And also Chris McGuire, who's our Marine and Coastal Program Manager, our oceans manager from Massachusetts, and who's very engaged in offshore wind work along with other colleagues that we have in the Northeastern and Mid-Atlantic States. Next.
So this is what that screening of wind looks like with energy modeling that we're just doing now. These are results, these are preliminary results, they're not final, but again, you can see this is what's legally available on the left for wind. Um, in the middle is that kind of more administrative, we know there are important environmental things, you might have to do extra reviews, but you could develop here. But that's us saying, well, let's not develop there. And then on the right, that's when we take everything that we have scientifically, it says this area is really important for conservation. That's what we have left. So just quickly, you can see across the top, onshore wind availability across the Western US legally right now is about 1,860 gigawatts of onshore wind, about 700 of offshore. If you look at the margins of the coast, you can see that kind of band of, of blue there. The darker blue is the higher resource areas. The lighter blue is less of a wind resource. Um, but legally, those areas that are colored are available right now for um, offshore wind development. Again, if we take these other designations of places, um, they might be important fisheries areas, they might be um, some kind of, um, you know, they're different state and federal designations. Again, they don't prevent development, but they probably require some kind of additional review. Well, if you take all those places off, the colored areas are what you have left. And you can see it cuts onshore about in half. And it doesn't cut much out in terms of offshore, it cuts off a couple hundred gigawatts. And then on the right, that's when we take this really restrictive look at environmental impacts. And you can see onshore and offshore, um, onshore really comes down a lot. We, we end up with only a, a couple hundred gigawatts left and offshore, um, we have less of a diminution, but it's still only about a third or a little more, less than a third of what we originally started with. But all told, you know, we still think that's that's enough wind resource to contribute. The West is going to rely more on solar. I'm not going to show you the solar maps um, in the interest of time, but together we do think there's still going to be enough uh, availability for developing low impact to meet net zero energy demands in the Western US uh, by 2050 even with this more restrictive approach. Um, that doesn't mean it'll be simple. I mean, some of these places are gonna be more expensive. Some places are relatively inaccessible. Um, transmission is a challenge. And that's one of the things we wanted to look at is what about transmission? Where are the places that transmission should go to unlock the best low impact places in the West? So next. So this is basically the transmission picture right now to reach the places that are most restrictive. Um, and we can use that existing diagnosis of where transmission is in the Western United States to say, okay, here are the places that are best for low impact solar, well, in this case, wind development. And here's the transmission that can get to those places. And we know there are gaps. So then next, and this is not gonna be easy to, interpret just looking at it, but this is our preliminary map showing what investments, what new, what changes in transmission will be needed to try and unlock those low impact places that don't currently have sufficient capacity um, to enable their development. And so that's kind of categorized by um, brand new lines that need to be built, lines that could be expanded, they're existing, but they don't have enough capacity now so that they could be expanding um, and they can be co-located using existing lines. And that's something we wanna prioritize is how do we make use of existing transmission quarters and infrastructure as much as possible. Uh, and then there's, um, and then there's a, another category, which is, I won't get into the details, but it's, it's about, changing transmission infrastructure within the system. Um, and there's a lot of technical stuff that I'm not totally up to date on all the details. So I won't uh, get myself in more trouble by trying to explain it in, in detail, but basically new lines, co-located lines, um, kind of 
infrastructure, tra transmission infrastructure adjustments um, that can help um, make these lower impact places a lot more attractive and a lot more feasible to develop in the future. So I'll just wrap up there and just leave you with this contact information. The Power of Place work for California, as I mentioned, was published two years ago. You can get it at this link. Um, you're welcome to contact me if you want more information. Um, Erica Brand uh, is our California Assistant Lands Director who's led this work in California and the Western United States. So if you want the really detailed information about some of the technical issues, Erica is the one to talk to, but you're welcome to contact me first too. So um, I'll leave it there. Thanks a lot, Nell. It's really, really interesting. Um, and great to see the amount of work that you're putting into this and the, um, yeah, the, the detail with which you're looking into this. Um, you mentioned that um, you're not the expert to talk to about grids, but since we're an organization that is about grids, I'm still going to ask a question about it. Um, so you said that um, obviously there is additional grid infrastructure needed to reach these sometimes remote places um, that you would like to uh, connect to the system um, and that you're looking into where these grids would smartly go what does it mean exactly where do they go so is it are you actually looking at building grids in a similar way that you're looking at building wind and solar because obviously that's also going to be energy infrastructure and that's also going to um if it's supposed to reach these remote areas cut through um possibly areas that are relevant for biodiversity so is there any plan to look at the places or site places for future grid infrastructure in a similar way that you're doing it for wind and solar? Yeah, great question, Stephanie. And the answer is yes. Um, that work we're doing that I showed for the Western United States is taking into account the environmental impacts of different ways to get to those low impact opportunities. So yes, we are taking that into account. You can't avoid all those impacts, as you can imagine, if you're building a, a major transmission line over you know, hundreds of kilometers, you are inevitably gonna impact some important historical areas, cultural areas, environmental areas. But we do try and take what we call least cost pathway to get there. In other words, we assign a, a resistance factor to those impacts as a transmission route is being planned. And, and the more of the resistance factor hits, you know, then it looks for a less resistant pathway. And I think some of your colleagues on this call, no doubt, who do transmission planning will appreciate that kind of an approach, but that's that's basically how we're doing it. All right, thanks a lot. Um, before I ask another question, I do wanna encourage everyone else who's on this call, and we do have quite a big group of people on this call, um, to actually ask the questions that they're interested in as well, because I'm assuming that um, after having heard everything that the TNC colleagues presented, there are a lot of questions that you, you're interested in having answered. Um, so please take this opportunity to um, yeah, get all those questions um, answered because we have the expertise in the room here at the moment. Um, Johanna, please go ahead. Do you hear me? Hi. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I'm particularly interested in the offshore, and I saw that you, um, you have touched on this a little bit. So what we are struggling with in Europe is, uh, we have relatively small sea spaces, of course, and there's so many other activities. It's really hard to find the space for this new incoming technology. So you have shipping, fishing, um, tourism, etc. Have you thought about this at all or how to approach this, maybe who to collaborate with to, uh, because I, I think then your map would probably look a little bit more complicated in the end. Yeah, that's a great question. And so first of all, I'm showing you the Western United States where there's, there's more uh, 
um, open areas with less conflict. There's less density of uses um, in general on the West Coast. The East Coast, it's different. It's probably somewhat more like Europe. I'm going to ask Chris McGuire if, Chris, you can kind of share how we're thinking about that complexity of, of values and uses along the Atlantic coast in the United States. Thanks, Nels. Um, yeah, just briefly, I think our, um, in, on the east coast of the US right now, there are only seven uh, wind turbines in, um, in the ocean off of the east coast. Uh, so we're very early on in the development. However, there are there is something like 25 gigawatts uh, that is in the permitting process that we expect will deploy in the next five to seven years. So um, that space is going to rapidly become that uh, conflicted area that you are referencing, Johanna. Um, you know, our, our role as an environmental organization, we have really focused first on the environmental concerns, um, while at the same time in our normal work, we work really closely with commercial fishing interests, aquaculture growers, and other uh, marine users. And so we've been trying to strike a balance in our um, role in this space in being the voice of uh, the environment, while also recognizing that there, is, there are use conflicts and um, trying to help by providing good data, help provide, uh, you know, find locations where the use conflicts are less. I think, as you know well, there are very few places where there are no use conflicts. Um, and so, you know, that's obviously is challenging. So we're, we aim to reduce environmental conflict while at the same time reducing use conflict and it's a delicate balance. You know, the last thing I'll say is you'll know that what often happens is that um, when there's a use conflict, in many cases, it's a huge conflict for a small number of actors. And that is a difficult um, a place to, uh, to try and find a way forward. And sometimes that's through mitigation or other tools. But, but yeah, it's, it's um, becoming a bigger challenge here every day. And um, we're struggling as an environmental organization to find our role in that conversation, to be honest. John, do you have anything to, to add? You know, you know, you've been in the trenches too on this issue. I think Chris said it well, and you said it well, Nels. I mean, we, the Nature Conservancy has been working on the offshore wind issues for a decade, uh, but it's accelerating rapidly now. And we have identified the need to really work together in a coordinated way across the Atlantic coast where most of the activity is happening to ensure um, that we, that we get protected a lot like what Nathan Cummins was talking about. I, I was writing down the points from your slide, Nathan, because um, you know it's about proper siting. We want to achieve this in a way that optimizes benefits for people, for nature. We see the opportunity in offshore wind not only to get renewable energy to reduce our our carbon um, footprint, but also to advance conservation in the ocean through through uh, the, the siting and the regulatory process around the siting is a way to achieve conservation in the water and, and possibly restoration and mitigation and equity in, in streams of income that come from the offshore wind. So we are just now standing up a program we have just hired and will later today announce, um, I think the, uh, the, the Atlantic Coast Offshore Wind Coordinator for the Nature Conservancy and we're excited to, to um, be in this in, in a more meaningful way. I, I would only add that, you know, we have a lot to learn probably from you and Europe as well about the, the wind situation because there's been so much more history of it there. Um, you know, the issues are somewhat different, but, um, but we are just in the early stages of really having that development take place that already, you know, you're at least 10 years ahead of us, so. Yeah, and that's what we've what we've found in in many areas that there's so much to learn from each other. So um, I'm always very thankful for opportunities like this where we actually get to exchange. Um, and thanks a lot to all three of you for your comments on this. Johanna, did that answer your question? Yeah, I was just going to say I think there's a lot to exchange, and so let's stay in touch. Yeah, for sure. Um,
John, you also gave uh, a keyword on the regulatory process that I want to ask a question on. But first, um, before I monopolize the whole Q&A session, um, I see a hand raised by Kirsten. Kirsten, um, please ask your question and uh, briefly introduce who you are. Thank you very much. Um... I'm Kirsten, I work for the NGO German Watch and I work on power grids and also wind energy, a bit together with Johanna on offshore wind energy and a bit in addition to her question, I have one for onshore wind now. Because um, we, we work a lot on participation processes, especially in power grids, but also in uh, the onshore wind we're interested in those aspects. And especially in Germany, we uh, see that um, there are many restrictions from the federal states on um, distances between housing. So not only towns or smaller villages, but <laughs> just some few houses in the remote areas. And they bring up huge distances now, which really shrinks the available places to construct wind turbines in first place. And you already mentioned now that I know you mainly focus on um, nature conservation, but have you come across distances that really, yeah, you have to keep one kilometer, two kilometers between a wind a park or a, a single wind energy plant and a house? Have you considered that if that minimizes the available area or not if it's just if you have not done then don't spend too much time what we you said before was already very helpful well i would just say thank you um <clears throat> chris can talk specifically you know this is a this is a large issue in our landscape you know roughly under what we call setbacks and it happens both in housing it happens in other urban developments and 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 there's a there's what we try to do is proliferate best practices um, and we definitely run into practices that I would not associate towards the best practices. And a lot of this is managed at the or county level. And so it's really working with a lot of the counties, a lot of the state governments, a lot of the city planners to understand how do we develop sort of best practices for community development? Because what happens, at least in our part of the country, is if we don't get those best practices, in, then we have a lot of counties that have good wind resource just putting out moratoriums saying we don't want any development in this area. And that's kind of the worst case scenario. So, you know, we, we are kind of driving towards best practices, but in terms of setbacks, I think because there's, they're so varied, we, we haven't taken them into account in our specific analysis, but Chris, I don't know if there's anything more you want to say on that. Yeah. So for this regional 17 state product that we assembled, we did include some setbacks, but we really tried to focus on the really big ones. You know, if it was a kilometer or more and could be readily mapped. So there are a few states, um, the state of Kansas, you know, I think there's a 14 county region, a huge chunk of eastern Kansas that the governor has said is off limits to wind development due to wildlife and scenery concerns. Um, the state of Oklahoma has uh, a, a setbacks law that mandates one and a half nautical mile, roughly three kilometer setbacks from public work, public hospitals, public schools, and public airports. Uh, there's, and it's, it's, it's just kind of a patchwork around the geography. Um, the state of Ohio has a fairly uh, restrictive property setbacks law. Um, and then, as Nathan said, there are a number of counties that have, you know, specific setback distances from roads. And so, it is a significant issue at the scale that we're working in. It, it really isn't that big of an issue because, you know, we, to us, working at this scale, once when we get once we get down to less than a kilometer, we we really see those as micro siting concerns that can kind of be addressed on the site by site level. But but it is a significant issue, particularly in the more populated areas of our geography. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, maybe we can stay a bit on the topic of um, more urban developments and um, the question of how to involve people in this process and how to involve communities in this process. Um, I know, Nathan, you've told me before that this is a question um, that you discuss internally a lot. And um, now she's just turned off the video, but I was gonna say that um, with Kirsten, we have um, a bit of an, an expert here when it comes to involving um, citizens into discussions specifically when it comes to building grid projects, but maybe we have some um, some insights here that could overlap with um, the exercise of siting for wind and solar. Um, 
So Kirsten, would you be ready to maybe say a few words on um, um, ideas of how to meaningfully involve communities in processes like these? Uh, I was expecting a question to me now, but... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't warn you at all. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I can try and I think Li I saw Liam before. Liam, if you have anything to add, please do, because Liam is also involved in this project. <laughs> um, the project that you are probably talking about is Shaping the Gritty Bay that mm -hmm. is running under AGI as well. Um, some important um, takeaways I would say is early involvement and really looking for a dialogue like really wanting to talk to people and not just like ending a process basically and then just telling people okay we're going to do this are you fine with it yes no no okay but we do it anyway this of course does not work like early engagement is one of the key factors I would say, and um, like really not, 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 somebody said it before, there are some minorities that are loud, that shout, but they are not the majority. So if you have a, a power lines that should be built up, there are some small minorities that do make a lot of, yeah, they, they just, they, they, they're against these power lines that they are built but uh, there's a huge majority that does not oppose it so it should be really pick carefully who is who is saying what and how many people are that and somehow try to find um, people that can act as multipliers also for being in favor of a project so that from within the communities they see that they are not the, the those few sh loud people that they are not the majority but other people are in favor of it and also try to communicate about why this is a good thing what it is needed for like explain why this project is important and that it is to make the energy transition track uh, successful and to decarbonize the energy system basically, but not just to say we're going to build it and not explain what for and try to bring in the benefits for the communities themselves. With power lines, it's sometimes a bit more difficult, but a wind farm, I mean, there could be like there could be benefit from the the incomes, for example. Does that somehow answer your question? And Liam, do you have anything to add? <laughs> Nothing to add. You smashed it. Nice one. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for being so ready to uh, to jump in and answer this um, yeah what German Watch has actually been doing as part of this project is to develop an argumentation map where they really map um, all the different arguments that different stakeholders in this discussion have for and against building grids um, and it really gives you an opportunity to to have a good overview of what the discussion is like um, what arguments uh, come up more often than others um, and then via this process, actually think about how to best engage with these arguments. So what are valid arguments that you actually need to um, take into consideration and rethink your process? And um, what are arguments that simply need to be debunked, um, but also by having a meaningful conversation? Um, so this is the way that um, we, together with German Watch, have been going about this process. Yes, you. Just to add, um, so far it has been mainly my colleague uh, working on this. That's why it didn't come to my mind at first place, but I will also work on it from now on. I'm a bit newer to German Watch. Um, if there are any questions by somebody here um, that would like to get in touch about this argumentation map, you are, of course, welcome to um, like find, find my uh, address on the website or ask uh, uh, Stephanie um, or anybody as at RGI, they have our contacts. Yes, we do. Yeah, that, I was gonna say that's that's really great. And this is an uh, issue we've been thinking about tackling definitely on a regional scale. Um, you know, we're, we're just getting there in the central United States, but, but some of our, especially European colleagues in the Western Balkans have done a lot of this um, thinking on this work as well. So I think there could be a really interesting conversation 
there to be to to be had as well. So um, it is something I think that we could we could both learn learn a lot from each other on. Great, would be great. Looking forward to the conversation. Um, I think that's a, a very good closing statement that um, what we've definitely learned today is that we do have a lot to learn from each other and that we should stay in touch and uh, should continue the conversation after this. Um, we have run over time a little bit already and I'm not seeing any questions in the, in the chat or um, it doesn't look like anyone has an urgent question by raising their hand. Um, so I want to close this webinar for today and uh, thank all the colleagues from TNC very, very much for taking so much time to talk to us today and sharing the great work that you've done in this field. Um, yeah, and as I said, I hope that we continue this conversation and um, thanks a lot to everyone else as well for taking the time this afternoon or morning to join us in the discussion. Yeah, Thank thanks so much for hosting us, Stephanie. We really appreciated it. Thanks a lot. Goodbye, everyone. Okay, bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.